So the next karma is obstructive or upapilaka karma. And it is both wholesome and unwholesome. This obstructive karma is karma which cannot produce its own result, but nevertheless obstructs and frustrates some other karma, countering its efficacy or shortening the duration of its pleasant or painful results. So this karma is not a supportive karma, but it interferes with the other karma. So it can obstruct and frustrate the efficacy of some other karma and shorten the duration of its results, pleasant or painful. Even though a productive karma may be strong at the time it is accumulated, an obstructive karma directly opposed to it may counteract it so that it becomes impaired when producing its results. Although the productive karma may be strong, this obstructive karma can interferes with it and so its producing power may be impaired. For example, a wholesome karma tending to produce rebirth in a superior plane of existence may be impeded by an obstructive karma so that it generates rebirth in a lower plane. So a wholesome karma which can produce rebirth in a superior plane of existence can be interfered with by an obstructive karma, so it gives rebirth in a lower plane. A karma tending to produce rebirth among high families may produce rebirth among low families. Karma tending to longevity may tend toward shortness of life. Karma tending to produce beauty may produce a plain appearance, etc. So in the opposite way, an unwholesome karma tending to produce rebirth in the great hells may be counteracted by an obstructive wholesome karma and produce rebirth in the minor hells or among the pedas. So it goes both ways. The obstructing the result of good karma or bad karma. Now the last one. In the opposite way, an unwholesome karma tending to produce rebirth in the great hells may be counteracted by an obstructive wholesome karma and produce rebirth in the minor hells or among the pedas. You have heard of Ajada Sattu. Now you know Ajada Sattu kills his own father. So he committed a crime called weighty karma. So normally, he would have to be reborn in Awichi hell. But later in his life or later in the life of the Buddha, he approached the Buddha and he requested the Buddha to teach about the benefits of the life of a monk. So Buddha taught to him uh, what is now called the Samanya Pala Sutta. This Sutta was translated by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. So at the end of that Sutta, he just uh, became a disciple of the Buddha and expressed his taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma Sangha, and then he left. When he left, Buddha said to the monks, monks, if this king had not killed his own father, he would have become a Sotapanna after the discourse. But he had very strong devotion for the Buddha and maybe he did uh, meritorious deeds to counteract his crime of killing his own father. So it is said that instead of being reborn in the great Awichi, hell, he was reborn in a lesser hell around the great Awiji hell. So wholesome karma and unwholesome karma can counteract with each other. During the course of existence, many instances may be found of the operation of obstructive karma, that is 
during our life. For example, in the human realm, such karma will obstruct the continuum of aggregates produced by karma, facilitating the maturation of karma that results in suffering and causing failures in regard to property and wealth of family and friends, etc. So when we meet with a failure regarding property or family or wealth or friends, then that could be this obstructive karma operating. In the lower realms, obstructive karma may counteract the rebirth producing karma contributing to occasions of ease and happiness. So those who are reborn in lower realms mean those who are reborn as a result of akusala. But a kusala obstructive karma may counteract that uh, rebirth producing akusala karma. And so uh, contributing to occasions of ease and happiness. Even though, let's say, a being is born as an animal, let's say as a dog, the obstructive kusala karma counteract the karma that gives him rebirth as a dog and makes him enjoy ease and happiness. I don't know how dogs are treated in this country. <laughs> but in the United States, dogs are treated as almost as human beings. Hmm? <laughs> to, to have a pet dog is not easy. You have to take him to the doctor, and then have injections and everything and needs or they, they also need. So sometimes we make jokes. Uh, if you are going to be reborn as a dog, <laughs> well, make a wish that you will be reborn in the United States. <laughs> so although they are reborn as uh, the result of Kusala Kama, now, now they are Kusala Kama, the, the obstructive Kusala Kama helps them uh, to enjoy uh, happiness, uh, ease, and so on. Now, the last one is called destructive karma. It destroys the other wholesome or unwholesome. So, this karma is also wholesome or unwholesome karma, which supplants other weaker karma, prevents it from ripening. So, it does not give the other karma to give results and produces instead its own result. Now, this is not always true. Now again, you know the story of Bimbisara. Bimbisara was uh, Ajadasatu's father. As a result of wearing his shoes in a chitya, he suffered from his soles of feet being cut. So that is the result of his bad karma in the past. Now that bad karma gives results as the suffering he experienced uh, being slashed with knife in the soles of his feet. But that akusala karma did not give him a rebirth result because after his death he was reborn as a deva. So some kusala karma got chance to give results and so after his death that kusala karma enables him to be reborn as a deva. So here the karma does not uh, give its own result. So uh, sometimes uh, it, it will give its own result and sometimes it may not. And also about Angulimala. Angulimala's Akusala are very great, but they were not able to give any results to Angulimala after his Parinibbana or death. Now, for example, somebody born as a human being may, through his productive karma, have been originally destined for a long lifespan, but a destructive karma may arise and bring about a premature death. So sometimes people meet with accident and died, and so we say, oh, 
this destructive karma is operating. At the time of death, at first, a sign of bad destination may appear by the power of an evil karma, heralding a bad rebirth. But then a good karma may emerge, expel the bad karma, and having caused the sign of a good destination to appear, produce rebirth in a heavenly world. There's a story to this statement. Once there was a monk named Sona. It is said that he was a Dhammakatika, he was a uh, preacher. He could give good Dhamma talks. He had a father and his father was a hunter all his life. He could not meet his father to abstain from leading that life of a hunter. But in his father's old age, he just ordained him against his wishes, against the wish of the father. So the father became an old monk. And when he was sick and he was about to die, he began to see signs of hell. There was a mountain near the monastery and what he saw at that moment was the dogs from the mountain running after him. So when he saw this sign, he said, Drive them away, Sona, drive them away, Sona, he said. Then the son asked, what is it? Then the father said, the dogs are chasing him. So the son knew, because the son was an arahant. He knew that now the signs of hell had appeared to his father. So he said to himself, how can I, an arahant, let my father to be reborn in hell? So he sent Samaniras, I mean novices, to fetch flowers from the nearby forest. And then he made a bed of flowers on the terrace of the stupa. And also he made offering of flowers. And then he had his father taken to that place. And then said to his father, Old monk, this puja is prepared for you. Now, offer this puja to the Buddha, saying, Bhante, it is a very poor gift from me. So, the father did as he was told, and when he had the Buddha and the dana in his mind, the sign of hell disappeared. And instead, the sign of celestial wall appeared to him. So he felt as though he were among the uh, celestial beings and he also saw um, celestial dancers uh, coming around him. So at that time he said, get away Sona, get away Sona. <laughs> now he, he doesn't want his son to be there. Then the Venerable Sona asked him, what is it? He said, there, your mothers are coming. <laughs> so, uh, Venerable Sona knew that now the signs of the world had appeared to the Father and so, and was reborn in the world of celestial beings. So first, a sign of bad destination appeared to the Father, and then later, the Son contrived so that his Father get the uh, the sign of good destination. So with the uh, sign of good destination in his mind, the father died and then he was reborn as a celestial being. That is why it is very important for us Buddhists to help people who are dying in this way or to pray for something for us when we have to face death. On the other hand, a bad karma may suddenly arise, cut off the productive potential of a good karma, and generate rebirth in a woeful ram. I do not remember the story about this, but there is one story 
told by uh, teachers, but it is not mentioned in, in the commentaries and sub-commentaries. And that is the story of King Asoka. Now, King Asoka was a very powerful king who ruled almost all of India. When he was sick, his ministers closed all his treasure houses so that he could not give away before he died. So when he asked about the treasure houses, the attendants, the, all the treasure houses are closed. So he was very sad about that. I was the ruler of the whole, let's say, Jambudipa, but now what I own is just a small fruit in my hand. So he was sad about that, and with that he died, and it is said that he was reborn as a snake, a big snake. I don't know how true that is. But since he had done a lot of meritorious deeds uh, during his life, he was in that existence for only a few days. But still, because of that sad thought, preceding his death, say he was reborn mm, as an animal. And according to Lady Seado, destructive karma can also be responsible for cutting off the efficacy of any of the sense faculties, the eye, ear, etc., causing blindness or deafness, etc., and can also cause sexual mutation. So this can be caused by this destructive karma also. So these are the four types of karma by way of their respective functions of producing, supporting, obstructing, and destroying. The next classification is by order of ripening, by order of giving results. So they are one, weighty karma, two, death proximate karma, three, habitual karma, and four, reserve karma. Now, weighty karma, in Pali it is called garuka karma, is karma of such powerful mor moral weight that it cannot be replaced by any other karma as the determinant of rebirth. On the wholesome side, this karma is the attainment of the jhanas. So jhanas are weighty karma on the wholesome side. On the unwholesome side, it is the five heinous crimes together with a fixed wrong view that denies the basis for morality. So there are five heinous crimes that are called weighty unwholesome karma and also a fixed wrong view a wrong view which is so fixed that it cannot be changed a wrong view that denies the basis for morality the five heinous crimes they are called in Pali anandriya karma anandriya means giving results uh, immediately they are parricide killing one's own father matricide, killing one's own mother, the murder of an arahant, the wounding of a Buddha, and maliciously creating schism in the Sangha. Now these are the five heinous crimes that can cause a person to be reborn in hell after this life. Now among them, killing one's own father is not difficult to understand, killing one's own mother and so on the murder of an arahant, but the wounding of a Buddha, I want you to understand this clearly. It is said that Buddha's body cannot be wounded, Buddha's body cannot be cut. So Buddha cannot be wounded by any weapon or whatever. The most the opponent can do to the Buddha is cause the blood to be congealed in the body. So that is meant by wounding of a Buddha here. So 
they cannot shoot the Buddha with the arrow, uh, with the gun, or they cannot cut the Buddha with the sword or dagger and so on. The most that can happen to the Buddha is that, that the blood congealed in his body. So when a person calls blood to be congealed in the body of the Buddha, he is said to uh, have committed this crime, the Anandariya Kama. Now, Devadatta they did that. Devadatta was the cousin of the Buddha, and he wanted to become the Buddha himself, and so he tried other ways. When all other means failed, he pushed a great piece of rock onto the Buddha when Buddha was walking up and down in the hill of Kijakuta, the false peak. So that big rock hit another rock, and then there was a splinter of that rock that hit the toes of the Buddha. And so it caused the blood to be congealed in the Buddha. Now, the royal physician Jivaga, when he heard this, went to the Buddha and cut open the wound of the Buddha and let the blood out. Now, it is explained in the commentaries that since Jivaka cut open the Buddha's body with the consent of the Buddha, it was kusala for him. Otherwise, it would have been a heinous crime. <laughs> so that is one uh, wounding of the Buddha. Please understand wounding in that sense, not cutting the skin of the Buddha. And then maliciously creating a schism in the Sangha, a division in the Sangha. Now, you lay people don't worry about this. <laughs> yeah? Don't worry about creating a schism in the Sangha. You cannot do it. Only a monk can do this crime. Because it is not just dividing Sangha in two groups. Actually, dividing Sangha in two groups and then performing the Sangha act simultaneously in one area or in one Sima. I think it is a little technical. <laughs> so, even Samaniras, I mean uh, novices, even bhikkhunis cannot do this crime. So it is reserved for monks only. <laughs> now, the Vinaya rules is that we have an area called a Sima, right? So in one Sima, only one Sangha can perform the act of Sangha. So the Sangha must be in here or here or here or wherever they want to be. But there must be only one group in one Sima. But if somebody makes two groups in the same Sima and perform the act of Sangha, like uh, reciting the Pati Mokha or some other acts at the same time, then he is said to have divided the Sangha. So that can be done by a monk only. So if he did that, then he committed this heinous crime. And Devadada did this crime also. So Devadada did two heinous crimes causing a schism in the Sangha and uh, wounding the Buddha or causing the blood to be uh, congealed in the Buddha. So these five are called weighty karma. So weighty karma means only these five and plus a fixed wrong view that denies the basis for morality. Just killing is not called weighty karma. So although Angulimala has killed many, many people, many human beings, that killing is not called weighty karma. Great amount of akusala karma, it is true, but it is not called weighty karma. So weighty karma is only the five heinous crimes and the fixed wrong view.
If someone were to develop the jhanas and later were to commit one of the heinous crimes, his good karma would be obliterated by the evil deed and the latter would generate rebirth in a state of misery. And here, for example, the Buddha's ambitious cousin Devadatta lost his psychic powers. Now, Devadatta was good in the beginning and he joined the order with the other Sakya princes and then he practiced meditation and he gained psychic powers. But he was reborn in hell for wounding the Buddha and causing his schism in the Sangha. So his having obtained psychic powers or jhanas did not help him to avoid being reborn in the great Awiji hell. But if someone were first to commit one of the heinous crimes, he could not later reach a sublime or supramundane attainment. That means he could not attain jhana or he could not attain maga or enlightenment because the evil karma would create an insurmountable obstruction. Thus, King Ajadasadu, while listening to the Buddha speak the Samanya Palasutta, the discourse on the fruits of recluseship had all the other conditions for reaching stream entry. So he could have become a Sotapanna at that time. He, he was a three root person. But because he had killed his father, King Bengvisara, he could not attain the path and fruit. So the karma that invariably give results in the next future life is called weighty karma. So if one has acquired weighty karma, either unwholesome or wholesome, then one will get the result of that weighty karma in the next immediate life. So there is no escaping from this ripening of this karma. The next karma is death proximate karma, asana karma, is a potent karma remembered or done shortly before death. So asana means near. So uh, asana karma means uh, karma uh, remembered or done shortly before death. The karma may be done just before death or the karma may have been done long ago but uh, the dying person remembered that karma at that moment. So that is immediately prior to the last jhavana process. If a person of bad character remembers a good deed he has done or performs a good deed just before dying, he may receive a fortunate rebirth like the father of that uh, venerable sauna. And conversely, if a good person dwells on an evil deed done earlier or performs an evil deed just before dying, he may undergo an unhappy rebirth. For this reason, in Buddhist countries, it is customary to remind a dying person of his good deeds to, or to urge him to arouse good thoughts during the last moments of his life. So people would invite monks and have monks uh, recite some sotas or like the Arahant Sona, they may create an environment where a dying person can do some meritorious deed. So it is important that we have good friends when we are approaching this last moment of our lives. When there is no weighty karma and a potent death proximate karma is performed, this karma will generally take on the role of generating rebirth. That means if there is no weighty karma, this karma will give rebirth result. This does not mean that a person will escape the fruits of other good and bad deeds he has committed uh, during the course of life. When they meet with conditions, these karmas too will produce their due results. So when th there are two, the weighty karma and death proximate karma, then weighty karma will give results. If there is no weighty karma but death proximate karma and other karmas, 
then that proximate karma will give results. So that is what is called by way of ripening, by way of giving, by the uh, order of uh, ripening, by the order of giving results. Habitual karma, the next one, achina karma, is a deed that one habitually performs, either good or bad. In the absence of weighty karma and a potent death proximate karma, this type of karma generally assumes the rebirth generative function. So if there are no weighty karma and death proximate karma, then this karma will give results. And this karma is one that a person uh, does habitually through his life or once done and then remembered again and again. So you can have habitual karma of either wholesome or unwholesome nature by doing just once that karma and then remembering it. If it is an unwholesome karma, you remember it and you are, uh, uh, you are sorry for that. Uh, you, you, you have regrets about that. And so if you think of it again and again and again, then you are doing it a habitual karma. And this habitual karma will give its bad results. On the wholesome side, you do some meritorious deed, and then you remember it again and again and again. But then it will become habitual karma for you. And in the absence of the other two karmas, then this habitual karma will give results. Now, between uh, death proximate karma and habitual karma, which do you think is more powerful? Habitual karma is more powerful, actually, because you do it many times and so it gains momentum. But here, in the order of giving results, that proximate karma uh, give results first. Suppose th there are that proximate karma, habitual karma, and the other reserve karma. Then that proximate karma will give results uh, before the habitual karma. Although habitual karma is actually more powerful than that proximate karma. And this, the ancient teachers explain with an old ox. Suppose uh, there are many cattle and the cowboy puts them in the cow, cow pen. Uh, what do you call the cow pen? So put them in the cow pen one by one. Then among them there is an old ox. Since he is old, he could not get into the pen quickly and so he entered the pen last, or close to the gate. Then the gate is closed. So the whole night they live there in a narrow space. And when in the morning the gates are open, that old ox was the first one to get out of the pen because he was close to it. Now there may be a stronger cattle in, in that group, but that old ox which is weak, uh, gets to get out of the pen first. So in the same way, although habitual karma is more powerful than the death proximate karma, since death proximate karma is close to death, close to the uh, javanas and death thought process, it gets chance to give results. So both of these are important ones. And sometimes the habitual karma itself will become death proximate karma. Because if you are in the habit of doing one merit again and again and again, then when you are close to die, you will just remember that karma. So habitual karma will become death proximate karma for many people. My father used to say, he rely on habitual karma rather than death proximate karma. Okay, now the last one is called reserve karma, katata karma. 
So it is any other deed not included in the three aforementioned categories, which is potent enough to take on the role of generating rebirth, so which can give a result. This type of karma becomes operative when there is no karma of the other three types to exercise this function. So out of these four, when there are all these four, then the Vedic karma will give result. If there are only the last three, then death proximate karma will give result. If there are only two, then habitual karma will give result. If there is only one reserve karma, then reserve karma will give results. So since they give results in this order, uh, this classification is by way of order of ripening or by way of order of giving results. The next group is with respect to the time of taking effect. That means with respect to the time of giving results. And there are four of them. And number one is immediately effective karma. And number two is subsequently effective karma. Three, indefinitely effective karma. And four, defunct karma. So four kinds of karma according to the time of giving results. Now the first one, immediately effective karma is karma which if it is to ripen must yield its results in the same existence in which it is performed. Suppose this karma is done in this life. So if it is to be the immediately effective karma, it must give results in this life. So we do something today and we will get the results a little later or tomorrow or next month and so on. So if we get the result in this life, then this karma is called immediately effective karma. The Pali word is a long one, Dita Dhamma Vedaniya. Dita Dhamma means uh, this life. Now Vedaniya means to be experienced. That means its results are to be experienced in this very life. This karma is which, if it is to ripen, must yield its results in the same existence in which it is performed. Otherwise, if it does not meet the opportunity to ripen in the same existence, if it does not get the chance to give result in this life, it becomes defunct. So it will not give results anymore. It, it becomes nothing. According to the Abhidhamma, of the seven javanas in a javana process, the first javana moment, being the weakest of all, generates immediately effective karma. Now you are familiar with the seven javanas. And each javana is accompanied by chetana or karma. Now that is why we say we acquire karma only when we reach the moments of javana. At the moment of uh, adverting, at the moment of receiving, investigating, determining, we do not acquire karma yet. But when we, we reach the moment of jivana, then we acquire karma, either kusala karma or akusala karma. Among the chetana concomitant with seven jivanas, the one that is concomitant with the first jivana, is the one that is called immediately effective. So, out of the seven javanas, let us say just javanas. Now, please understand this is karma. So, out of the seven javanas, the first javana gives results in this very life. Because being the weakest of all, you might think that to give results in this life, it must be very powerful. But it is said that it is the weakest of all, <laughs> the first jivana, because it, it has just arisen. There is no repetitive uh, force yet, so it is weak. 
Since it is weak, it gives results in this life. Now you may compare the res result in this life with the result to be, uh, to be experienced in, in the next life. Suppose you are to be reborn as a celestial being. So as the immediate effect in this life, then you may become rich. But what human riches can compare to the enjoyment in the world of celestial beings? So we cannot compare. It may be thousands of times better than uh, what we get in this life. So, although we may think that the first jivana is strong to give results in this life, it is not really strong. So, because it is the weakest of all, it gives results in this life. And when it gives results in this life, the result may be in the form of some rupa, in the form of wealth, houses, or some conditions, but not as the result at the moment of relinking. So actually it is not so great. And the second is subsequently effective. In Pali it is called upapaja vedaniya. This karma is karma which, if it is to ripen, must yield its results in the existence immediately following that in which it is performed. If the karma is done in this life, then this karma will give results in the next immediate life. We call this life as first life and the next life as second life. So the subsequently effective karma gives results in the next life, the second life. Otherwise it becomes defunct. If it does not give a result in the next life, in the second life, it becomes nothing. This type of karma is generated by the last jhavana movement in a jhavana process, seven jhavana. Because it is, seven jhavana is supposed to be very strong because it gets momentum. So, since it is very strong, it gives results in the next or second life. This type of karma is generated by the last jhavana movement in a jhavana process, which is the second weakest in the series. But this is not accepted by all teachers. There are two opinions about that. One teacher, Lady Siaro, thinks that it is like you throw a rock in the air and then it stops somewhere and then it goes down. So the first jhavana and the second jhavana, more powerful, third jhavana, fourth jhavana is the most uh, the strongest for, according to Lady Sierra. And then when it reaches a fifth, sixth, then it goes down. So the fourth is the most, uh, the, the strongest of the seven. But this is not accepted by all teachers. So there are many teachers said that since it, it is the a matter of repetition condition in the 24 modes of conditions in the Patana, it must gain momentum one after another. So the seven must be the most powerful or the strongest. Since it is strongest, it gives results in the immediate next life. And then the third one, indefinitely effective. Aparapariya Vedaniya. This karma is karma which can ripen at any time from the second future existence onwards. Please note this carefully, this is important. From the second future existence onwards means from the third life. Future life is the second life and second future means the third life. So if we take this life as first life, then immediate future life is second life. And then the life after that immediate future is the third life. So from that third life onward, this karma uh, produces results. Whenever it gains an opportunity to produce results, so whenever it gets chance, it will give result beginning with the third life. 
This karma generated by the five intermediate jhavana movements of a cognitive process never becomes defunct in the next life. Suppose you are to be reborn as a celestial being. So as the immediate effect in this life that you may become rich. But what human riches can compare to the enjoyment in the world of celestial beings? So we cannot compare. It may be thousands of times better than uh, what we get in this life. So although we may think that the first jivana is strong to give results in this life, it is not really strong. So because it is the weakest of all, it gives results in this life. And when it gives results in this life, the result may be in the form of some rupa, in the form of wealth, houses, or some conditions. But not as the result at the moment of relinking. So actually it is not so great. And the second is subsequently effective. In Pali it is called Upapaja Vedaniya. This karma is karma which, if it is to ripen, must yield its results in the existence immediately following that in which it is performed. If the karma is done in this life, then this karma will give results in the next immediate life. We call this life as first life and the next life as second life. So the subsequently effective karma gives its results in the next life, the second life. Otherwise it becomes defunct. If it does not give a result in the next life, in the second life, it becomes nothing. This type of karma is generated by the last jhavana movement in a jhavana process, seven jhavana. Because it is, seven jhavana is supposed to be very strong because it gets momentum. So since it is very strong, it gives results in the next or second life. This type of karma is generated by the last jhavana movement in a jhavana process which is the second weakest in the series. But this is not accepted by all teachers. There are two opinions about that. One teacher, Lady Siaro, thinks that it is like you throw a rock in the air and then it stops somewhere and then it goes down. So the first javana and the second javana more powerful, third javana, fourth javana is the, most, uh, the strongest for, according to Lady Siaro. And then when it reaches a fifth, sixth, then it goes down. So the fourth is the most, uh, the, the strongest of the seven. But this is not accepted by all teachers. So there are many teachers said that since it, it is the a matter of repetition condition in the 24 modes of conditions in the Patana, it must gain momentum one after another. So the seven must be the most powerful or the strongest. Since it is strongest, it gives results in the immediate next life. And then the third one, indefinitely effective. Aparapariya Vedaniya. This karma is karma which can ripen at any time from the second future existence onwards. Please note this carefully, this is important. From the second future existence onwards means from the third life. Future life is the second life and second future means the third life. So if we take this life as first life, then immediate future life is second life. And then the life after that immediate future is the third life. So from that third life onward, this karma uh, produces results. Whenever it gains an opportunity to produce results, so whenever it gets chance, it will give result beginning with the third life. 
This karma is generated by the five intermediate jhavana movements of a cognitive process. Never becomes defunct so long as the round of rebirths continues. So, so long as you are in this samsara, this karma, indefinitely effective karma, which is actually a chetana concomitant with the five jhavanas in between the first and the seventh, will never become defunct so long as the round of rebirth continues. And this is our hope. Even though a person may be reborn in hell, there is hope that he may one day get out of hell. Even though a, a being is reborn as a, an animal, and even though he doesn't get much chance to do kusala deeds during the life of an animal, still there is hope that he can get out of the life of an animal and being reborn as a human being or a deva. Because of this, store of indefinitely effective karma. So we, we, all of us have this store of indefinitely effective karma. And so they will give results whenever mm, they get the chance to do so. No one, not even a Buddha or an Arhant, is exempt from experiencing the results of indefinitely effective karma. So even the Buddhas and Arhants experience or enjoy or suffer the results of this indefinitely effective karma. So please note this carefully because many people do not write or do not teach this distinctly. They said from the next life or something like that. In Pali, apara means the other. So apriya means the other life. So they take the other life to mean the second life. But if it is to give results <coughs> beginning with second life, it will overlap with the second one, subsequently effective life. But they are not to be overlapping with each other. So the first one gives results in this life. And the second one in the next or let us say second life. And the third one, indefinitely effective karma, give reserve beginning with the third until the end of samsara. And when these three do not give results in their uh, allotted time, they become defunct. So they will not give results. So this term does not designate a special class of karma but applies to karma that was due to Rabin in either the present existence or the next existence, but did not meet conditions conducive to its net maturation. So, <clears throat> did not get chance to give results, and so they do not give results. If they do not give results in their allotted time, they become defunct. In the case of Arhans, all their accumulated karma from the past, which was due to Rabin in their future lives, becomes defunct with their final passing away. So when they pass away, there is no more rebirth for them. And so all the karmas they did in the past become defunct, either kusala or akusala. They cannot give results anymore, simply because there is no more rebirth for an arahant. So these are the four kinds of karma by way of the time they give results. So again, there are seven jhavanas. The first jhavana give results where? In this life. The karma at first jhavana. And then seven jhavana, karma at seven jhavana gives result in the next life. And the karma during the five moments in between uh, give results beginning with the third existence or third life until the end of uh, samsara. And if any of these does not give results in its allotted time, then it becomes defunct. 
And when an Arahant or a Buddha or a Pachika Buddha pass away, when they attain Parinibbana, then all their karmas become defunct simply because there is no more rebirth for um, Buddhas, Pachika Buddhas and Arahants, and so they cannot give results. So now we have gone through these three, three sets of four each. So the first set is by way of function, the second set by order of ripening or giving results, and the third is by the time of giving results. Now, as I said before, the manual just gives us a list of these. It does not go into any detail about these 12 kinds of karma. Uh, just a classification and the list of the karmas. But with the fourth, by place of rabbinating, the other will go into some detail. Okay, we will do it tomorrow. Now there are some questions today. Is Sankara in Panchakanda the same as Kama? Kama is included in Sankara in Panchakanda. Now let me explain first Panchakanda. Now Panchakanda means five aggregates. Now these five aggregates are aggregate of matter aggregate of feeling, of perception, of mental formations, and of consciousness. Now, the first one is meta. Now, the second one is feeling. And the third one is perception. But the fourth one consists of 50 chedasikas. 50 chedisikas other than feeling and perception. Feeling is one separate aggregate and perception is another separate aggregate. But the other 50 chedisikas are collectively called sankhara aggregate. And this sankhara aggregate is translated as karmic formations of volitional activities and so on. Now, among the 50 Chetisikas that constitute Sankhara aggregate, there is Chetana. So Kamma is included in the Sankhara aggregate in five aggregates. And whenever you see the word Sankhara, you have to be careful because Sankhara can mean one that produces and also it can mean one that is produced. One meaning is the active meaning and the other is passive meaning. And you need to know which meaning is intended in a given context. That is not easy. Sometimes even monks have to rely on the explanations given in the commentaries and sub-commentaries. Now, among the five aggregates, there is Sankhara aggregate. The word Sankhara there is to be understood in the active sense. So, the mental states that does, that produce, that make. They have some activity and so they are said to make or they are said to produce. And in Paticca Samubhara, you have the word Sankhara. So that Sankhara is also to be understood in an active sense something that produces, because Sankara means karma there. But in the saying that all Sankaras are 
impermanent. All sankharas are dukkha. Then sankhara is to be understood in passive meaning. Sankhara means those that are made. That means those that are conditioned. So whenever you see the word sankhara, please try to find out whether it is in the active sense or passive sense to be understood. It is not always easy. So we always have to rely on the commentaries to explain to us. So, karma is sometimes called sankhara. Actually, the sankhara aggregate means actually karma aggregate. That means a group of mental factors headed by sankhara, which is karma. And then, the, the question is, if so, then is Sankara the Javana Chaitas? Sankara is Kama. So, Kama means volition, Chaitasika. So, strictly speaking, Sankara is not Chaita. Sankara is the Chaitana or uh, the volition which is a Chaitasika. Sometimes we may talk without differentiating uh, the consciousness and karma. But strictly or technically speaking, we have to differentiate these two. So chaita is one thing and karma or chaitana is another which is a mental state and which accompanies uh, chaita. The world is destroyed by fire, water, and air. According to the table, our present world will be destroyed by what element? <laughs> and under which number? <laughs> we, we don't know <laughs> uh, which number we are in right now. But it is m probable that it will be destroyed by fire. Because fire, uh, de destruction by fire takes place how many times? In eight times, we have seven times destroyed by fire. So it is probable that the present world will be destroyed by fire. It's been stated that the coming of the Maitreya Buddha will be when the human lifespan will be around 80,000 years. How does one cultivate in the practice so that one will be able to meet the Maitreya? <laughs> but, you know, even the ancient teachers, ancient authors, uh, made aspirations like that. Uh, as a result of writing this book, say, may I be reborn in the Tusita heaven and see the uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva and then when he goes down to the human world and become the Buddha, may I also be reborn in the human world and become his disciple. Now, this manual, the original one, is commented upon by different commentators. There are sub-commentaries to this book. So one sub-commentary, which was widely used until this time, it's called Vibhavini Tika. So that Tika was written by one called Sumangala. And at the end of that Tika, he made this wish. He was very devoted to his teacher who wrote a Sinhalese paraphrase to this manual. So that teacher made a, an aspiration that he be reborn and to Sita and see the Maitreya Buddha and then become his disciple and so on. So the author of Vibhavani, the, the sub-commentary, also makes a similar aspiration. And he said, may I see my teacher as teacher in that life and may I see the Maitreya Buddha. So whenever you do a meritorious deed, you make that wish. Say, may I be reborn? 
during the time of the Maitreya Buddha, see him and listen to his uh, Dhamma and attain enlightenment, something like that. At which plane system will be conducive for one to be reborn to earth once their lifespan in that plane system expire, based on current present time to the era of Maitreya? <laughs> I think you don't have to worry about the time because it is said that the future Buddha Maitreya will uh, become the Buddha when human lifespan is 80,000 years. And so to just have wish, just make the aspiration that you be reborn at the time when Maitreya Buddha comes to this world. How is it possible for one so developed and attain asanyasata realm and yet is disgusted with mind? Isn't this wrong view? Yes, it is wrong view. They are described as tetya. Tetya means having wrong views, people having wrong views. And how are they to develop and practice without a mind? No, they cannot develop or they cannot practice so long as they are there because they are like statues. So they do not have mental activity at all and so they cannot practice anything there. They cannot develop their mind there because there is no mind with them. So they will be in that existence for 500 great eons and at the end then they will come down to the the human world or the deeper world. As you think, they are those that have wrong view because it is not the right view to say that because of the mind we suffer. So we suffer because we have both mind and body, uh, mind and matter, not just mind or not just matter. So both these people who develop disgust for uh, rupa and disgust for mind are those who go to the extremes. So that is why this asanya sada is also included in the realms that we are not to want to reborn in. Now, isn't killing, especially of many people, a weighty karma enough to obstruct phala consciousness? No, it is not weighty karma, so it cannot uh, obstruct phala consciousness, and that is why. Angulimala was able to attain Arahanship. Uh, you have clearly stated that only Tihe too, again three root, huh? <laughs> three rooted person can attain the different stages of enlightenment. Did Buddha imply only to three rooted persons when he gave the assurance that whoever practiced the four foundations of mindfulness from seven days to seven years? can be expected to realize first, second, or third stages of enlightenment. Yes, because only those born with three roots can attain uh, first or second or third or fourth uh, stages of enlightenment. So when Buddha uh, said you can reach attainment in seven days or uh, seven years and so on, he had in, in mind uh, the beings with three root consciousness as rebirth consciousness. The Buddha implied only three rooted persons when he gave the assurance. So now today we come to, uh, we have uh, finished the three groups of classification of karma uh, into 12 kinds. So tomorrow we will uh, study the Kama by place of ripening. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.